Good afternoon, everybody, dear friends, dear colleagues. It's my pleasure to welcome you to, to this Africa PCR webinar entitled How Should I Treat a Patient with Chest Pain and Dyspnea, a Patient's Journey? And we are tracing to, uh, uh, we are going to trace uh, the patient's journey from uh, primary care to cardiovascular and cardiovascular surgery centers with a patient with valvular heart disease in Tunisia, in Mauritania, in, and in North Africa. To, uh, we have to meet uh, also, uh, we have uh, uh, three uh, objectives. Uh, we have to, our fourth objective is to discuss about the patient journey in Africa and identify the country and region differences for the management of valvular heart disease. Our second objective is to recognize the current indication for catheter-based versus surgery in the management of valvular heart disease. And the last one is to compare that management with the current standard of care. Of care. So to meet these objectives, uh, we I am very uh, fortunate, very happy, uh, very honored uh, to have uh, with me uh, many experts from Tunisia, uh, from uh, Mauritania, and from the United States. And uh, I have with me uh, Professor Habib Gamra, uh, who is the head of cardiology department in Monastir from Tunisia. Uh, prof prof uh, professor uh, Ahmed Ultba, the director of cardiology center in Mauritania. Uh, Dr. Fadel Ahmed, interventional cardiology a cardiologist from Mauritania, and Dr. Sid Mohammed, interventional cardiologist from uh, Mauritania. Uh, I, I, I am uh, Leila Abid, Professor Leila Abid. I am the uh, head of cardiology department, uh, SFAX, uh, uh, Tunisia. Uh, and uh, I'd like to uh, thank uh, the Oro Africa PCR board for uh, the invitation for this kind of invitation and for offering uh, us this uh, kind opportunity to share with you our uh, experience of uh, clinical uh, practice. Uh, so uh, uh, now uh, I have the, the pleasure uh, to uh, invite uh, Professor uh, Gamra uh, to uh, share with us uh, his uh, patients so uh, the floor uh, is, you, uh, is yours, uh, Dr. Gamera. Thank you, Leila, uh, and thanks to the board of uh, Africa PCR for this uh, great opportunity. Uh, so the, uh, to meet the objectives uh, that you just mentioned, Leila, uh, we have a, a patient, uh, ca uh, the case of a patient, uh, to uh, share with you and that we'll be discussing later on the details of the history of this patient. So let's go to the first part of the video that we have made with the patient's wife. Thank you very much for uh, this opportunity to share with, with you the uh, journey of the uh, patient of ours. Uh, uh, and uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, 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 the widow of the patient who accepted actually uh, uh, to come today and to uh, respond uh, to our questions regarding the journey of that uh, patient. So my question was, uh, what symptoms the patient had and uh, uh, to what uh, hospital did he go with his symptoms? Okay. وشي عادي شوية قلت لها لا أنا عملت له تخطيط على القلب قلت لها الساعة استنش قلنا عملك شوية تخطيط على القلب كيف متل تخطيط على القلب قلت الدقة طايحة جملة ديرك الطرب طلب بلانس عدت في لب بلانس عدت لبلانس عدينا في المهدي للمهدي ديرك المهدي عدت عليه كل شيء مشي مع أخوه كعدت عليه قلت له هذا عملي استعجلي 
اخوي تربت علي احنا الظروف ما تخيبش عليك تربت علي شويه هو ما ما حبش قال لك اذا في سجيتني مش تعملي okay. عملي اوكي سو تو ذا بيشنت هيستوري ستارتد وذ سيمبتومز Uh, with uh, lightheadedness, the patient uh, he has lipotemia and he has shortness of breath. So we went to the uh, uh, to, to the closest uh, regional hospital where he lives, uh, and then uh, they found that the patient had bradycardia. So they referred him to the uh, uh, to the university hospital, the closest uh, to their village, uh, where uh, actually they found out that the patient has an AV block. And they did recommend a pacemaker uh, in the private practice because they don't have facilities to perform that procedure in that hospital. So the patient, because he cannot afford to do the procedure in the private sector, he left the hospital without, uh, uh, of course, the uh, approval of the of the doctor, and uh, he went uh, to Monastir. Uh, hospital, university hospital where I work, uh, and he was seen by a doctor who did uh, uh, indicated his hospitalization. Well, so in summary, uh, this is a 70-year-old male uh, with a history of COPD, smoker, who has no medical insurance uh, and uh, uh, who lives in a rural area with difficulties accessing to medical care. The patient was referred to the outpatient clinic of our department by the GP of his local primary health care center uh, after having uh, been admitted in another institution as the uh, patient's wife was, uh, uh, was uh, mentioning. Uh, as symptoms, the patient was having uh, exertional chest pain and dyspnea that have been worsening gradually during the last few months with lightheadedness that has indicated Uh, a pacemaker in the uh, other hospital where actually he was taken care of. They did suggest to him to have a pacemaker in the private sector because there was no cath lab in that institution. But the patient, uh, again, he didn't have any medical insurance, didn't have any financial support, and he declined that. So he left the hospital. Uh, and uh, he came to our uh, uh, outpatient clinic, uh, where a physical exam showed an aortic ejection murmur in the upper sternum border. The uh, EKG that you can see here did not show, actually did not show a AV block, uh, but it showed a sinus bradycardia. Echocardiogram uh, showed a... Uh, Uh, a left ventricular hypertrophy with uh, a uh, good LV function, but with a severe aortic stenosis and mean aortic uh, 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 gradient of 45 millimeter of mercury. Back to you later. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gamrev, for this interesting case. Uh, so, uh, Uh, we'd like to see the opinion of uh, a Mauritan- Mauritanian expert, and I will ask yes. a question to Dr. Fadel about uh, the common patient journey in Mauritania. So how uh, do you manage this, this patient in uh, Mauritania? Uh, and my question is uh, especially, as I said, about uh, uh, the journey of the patient, is uh, uh, about the management in the primary care. Uh, of this patient, uh, do the GP uh, refer the patient to the cardiologist in your in Mauritania, or the patients could uh, go directly to uh, cardiologist uh, uh, suffering from uh, symptoms? Up to you, uh, uh, Dr. Fadil. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Professor Alida. Thank you uh, for uh, all of you guys uh, in this. Uh, you know, PCR officials, and thank you for all of you professors and doctors who, uh, you know, uh, gave their very expensive time uh, to uh, attend and, uh, you know, see with us. Thank you so much. So thank you, thank you, Professor Gamana, for, you know, this nice presentation for this uh, 70, uh, 72 years old male who presented with, uh, you know, didn't see cop, but was close to see cop, shortness of breath and chest pain. Uh, and an ECG showed uh, bradycardia and examination showed ejection systolic murmur. So I think in Mauritania, the case almost 
you know, you know, it's we, we see a lot of cases in Mauritania like this, and it tend uh, to you know start with a primary medical doctor or even you know like a nurse who will see a, you know a person will come with symptoms like this. Now they they will be very lucky if they happen to see by a, a doctor who will send them to you know national national center to the you know national center of cardiology. Now, if this happened in Newark Short or in the capital, I think most likely the general physician will be, you know, if, if not triggered by the symptoms, I think the ECG will trigger, you know, the patient to be referred to, uh, to the national center. So uh, I think a couple of diagnoses came to my mind, you know, what's going on here. A patient is bradycardic, patient have, you know, shortness of breath and patient also have uh, chest pain. So uh, eco care, I think this is a short with bradycardia, Professor Gamal also, uh, you know, concentric LVH. There was like team version, team version in the infralateral leads with the sinus bradycardia. Surprisingly, the ECG showed in the rural area, uh, AV block. Uh, but for some reason, the, you know, the ECG improved, you know, it moved from, I, I don't know, maybe the doctor who read, the ECG in the rural area wasn't like an EKG expert, you know, saw it as a complete heart block. But by the time the patient was seen by Professor Kamara, the case is already in sinus bradycardia. So coming back to Mauritania, uh, I think uh, we do not have a lot of ECG in the rural area, uh, but we do, I think most of our doctors take, you know, syncope or near syncope, a very alarming symptoms. Uh, but it may take some time, they, you know, I think they may order NFS, you know, the CBC complete blood count. They may, they may say, you know what, probably you are anemic, may, you may, probably you have some of that thyroid problems. They, you know, but if the patient, you know, lost, uh, was close for loss of consciousness, they will send him directly to our center or to the National Center of uh, Cardiology. I think this patient was lucky enough to, you know, to, to, to be very close to, you know, to syncope or light headache. Uh, uh, so yes, I think ECO, when, when, when we did the ECO, we saw concentric LVH. I didn't hear what the Professor Gamara saw on the valvular area. I was wondering if the patient have hypertrophy of the septum, perhaps obstructive, not obstructive. And I thought he's a smoker. I didn't see any scene of ischemia on his electrocardiogram. So I wonder about his aortic valve, most likely, uh, you know, his septum, ischemic heart disease. I'll, you know, I, I'm still waiting for the blood work. And uh, I don't know if you have any more specific question elaborate for me, Professor elaborate for me. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Fadel, for your interesting uh, opinion. Uh, I think that will open the, the, the discussion uh, between the different experts to highlight the differences and similarities uh, uh, between the two uh, countries, Tunisia, Mauritania, and uh, the management of uh, these uh, patients. Uh, so probably um, I will ask a question to, um, to Dr. Uh, Ahmed uh, about uh, the, the etiology of uh, valvular heart disease uh, in um, in Mauritania, because if we uh, look to the figures presented by Dr. Uh, Gamra, uh, probably uh, it is a degenerative uh, cause of uh, valvular heart disease. Uh, but um, in uh, the North Africa, we know that the more common uh, etiology is uh, rheumatic heart disease. So uh, my, my question uh, is a rheumatic heart disease still the main uh, etiology of uh, valvular heart disease uh, in uh, Mauritania? Uh, uh, okay, I am uh, Dr. Sid Mohammed. Uh, thank you for PCR, uh, Africa PCR for their invitation uh, for this webinar. I am the head of uh, Department of Cardiology International uh, of Center, National Center uh, of Cardiology. Uh, etiology in, uh, of uh, the valvular disease in Mauritania is uh, very uh, frequently uh, rheumatismal uh, heart. Uh, uh, you, you 
you can in this case if pathology is a, a degenerative uh, valvular uh, health because is uh, all the main uh, 72 years <coughs> i think uh, pathology of the uh, degenerative uh, valvular disease uh, i am not v use uh, a, a av block um, but sometimes is uh, AB block uh, of uh, and uh, stenosis uh, aort valvula. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Leila, the, 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 the the yes, Dr. Gamra? It, yes, Dr. Gamra? Yeah, regarding the AB block, uh, again, just to retrace, just to retrace once again the journey of this patient. So the patient went to the uh, primary health center of his village. He was, because of these symptoms, chest pain, dyspnea, but also lightheadedness, he was transferred to a university hospital, but without cath lab. And when they were, he was admitted there. And when he was admitted, they have found in one of the EKGs an AV block, which was paroxystic. So it was not Paroxy. permanent AV block. That's why in the EKG that we have received, what that we have done on him when he came to our department, uh, did not show AV block. But the AV block was documented, and it was documented rather the other uh, hospital. I think we should have another EKG uh, in our uh, file here, but they didn't want to show it because I mean just just uh, uh, just uh, to mention it because it doesn't add anything to the. Uh, history of the patient, but AV block was certain. Okay. Yes, certainly it's a paroxysmal uh, AV block, AV. and the, the link, there is a tight link uh, between aortic stenosis and uh, AV uh, block, block, especially when the etiology is degenerative. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, um, in fact, you, Dr. Game presented the, the case of a uh, patient who has uh, aortic stenosis and I think that was a, a delay of presentation of this patient. Uh, he had uh, symptoms worsening in the last few months. Uh, so uh, my question for our colleagues from uh, Mauritania, uh, do patients uh, present uh, late like a Tunisian one? Uh, this is a question for Dr. Ahmed. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think the journey of valvular patients uh, in this case is the same uh, so in uh, Mauritania. Uh, the patients consult uh, very late in very advancing stage of uh, disease. So the diagnostic is uh, sometimes is very uh, difficult to do in the peripheral or the rural uh, Place because we don't have a lot of eco machine and uh, sometimes uh, just uh, for uh, chest pain or uh, medical examination we can uh, uh, think about uh, valvular or uh, heart disease. Uh, I, I, in these uh, patients, the most problem is uh, the uh, advancing advanced uh, case and uh, patient with, without insurance. So this uh, also is a big problem in our country because of the cost, very, very high cost of uh, the uh, 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 cardiac surgeon and uh, uh, treatment with uh, angioplasty or uh, Peacemaker also is very expensive in uh, Mauritania. Uh, in this case, I think is uh, it was uh, uh, similar of uh, our uh, uh, case. In every day, we see this uh, kind of uh, patients without insurance and in very advancing uh, uh, pathology. So uh, in uh, our question about, question about uh, rheumatic valvular is still uh, in Mauritania, 
a common uh, a, a common uh, a first case of valvular heart disease. Thank you, Leila. Okay. Okay, okay. thank you, uh, Dr. Ahmed. Dr. Kamia Gamra, do you have uh, additional questions from the uh, box, uh, chat box? Is there any questions? Or you move to the... We have many people, we have many people connected now from, uh, from Ethiopia, from Sudan, uh, but we don't have questions yet. But I do have a question to our uh, Mauritanian colleagues. Uh, just uh, to try to understand why the patients present late with these symptoms. Is it only medical insurance? And in that case, what's the percentage of the population who have medical insurance? Or is it the fact that they are away from urban cities where there is, uh, you know, optimal care like echocardiography and all that. So uh, about uh, the percentage, uh, I think uh, only 25% of our population have a medical insurance. So it's very uh, big uh, part of population without. Uh, and uh, we have a single operational center of cardiac heart disease. Uh, so the difference between Mauritania and uh, Tunisia is very huge. Uh, you know, in the uh, uh, sub-Saharan countries, the uh, uh, surgical and uh, uh, cardiac center with uh, interventional cardiology or uh, uh, cardiac surgery is very, very few center. They do that uh, kind of intervention. Uh, so uh, patients come very late in the single center uh, in Mauritania. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, I think that we, uh, we move to the second part about the treatment of uh, these patients. And uh, uh, let's see what happened uh, with uh, these patients, uh, with the patient of the Bergamra? So up to you, the Bergamra. How do you treat your patient? Okay. He was admitted to our uh, cardiology department where he had his pacemaker. Uh, aortic stenosis was identified during that hospitalization and a uh, aortic valve replacement was indicated. Uh, he was referred to a, uh, a cardiac surgery department in uh, uh, Ariana, which is next to Tunis, capital, Tunis uh, city. Uh, but because of the pandemic, the patient did not want to go. And uh, he decided to, uh, to, to wait. Uh, okay. Corona. So what happened during the COVID uh, pandemic, he, he stayed at home uh, with uh, minimal, uh, minim, minimal symptoms uh, until last uh, April when he started having a worsening shortness breath uh, and, and symptoms of heart failure. So he went to the, uh, uh, to the uh, regional hospital where he presented in the first time. They did refer him to the uh, university hospital in Medea, which is closest uh, to him. And they did refer him to our hospital in Monastir, where he has actually his, his file. Uh, and he was admitted at that time in a... Uh, 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 with an episode of uh, failure. Uh, okay. What did you say after that? I said I was 20 years old. They said that I was going to go to the hospital. I didn't answer the question. I didn't answer the question. Okay. So, so when he was admitted, he was managed with heart failure, and then he was referred to another cardiology department because the initial one, they did not want to accept him because he declined 
uh, and, and he missed his first appointment. So he was referred to Sfax University Hospital, another cardiology, uh, cardiac surgery department in the south uh, of Tunisia. Uh, when he did present there, uh, they found that he was missing the report of a, a GI uh, workup, the uh, fibroscopy. Uh, and then they asked him to bring that document before uh, taking him to the operating room for his aortic valve replacement. اوكي تو معناها في صفاقس ما قبلوش ما قبلوش وقالوا له جيب لنا هاك التحاليل هذيك التحاليل بعد ذلك شنو صار؟ During that uh, time period he was uh, he left the hospital of course uh, and he was waiting for the report of the uh, GI workout uh, at that time uh, he was going back and forth to the emergency department of his uh, regional hospital uh, until uh, one day he decompensated and he died in the emergency room before uh, going to uh, cardiac surgery. So to summarize again what was mentioned during this uh, interview, during the hospitalization, the patient had syncope with AV block that you, you did not see in the EKG that they have shown you. So the decision was to place a dual pacemaker, dual chamber pacemaker, Coronary of course, as preparation of the management of aortic stenosis was performed, that it was normal. And the patient was referred to surgery for a surgical aortic valve replacement in an other institution we don't, because we don't have cardiac surgery on site. Now, uh, what happened uh, uh, is the pandemic, because this all happened during the COVID pandemic, and the patient did not want to go to surgery. He did not want to have surgery. And then he elected to stay at home and thus he was lost to follow up. And by the way, I did ask the question to the, I did ask the question to the wife and she said he stayed at home all that period. And of course he has minimal symptoms at that time. But almost uh, one hour and a half later, he was admitted to our CCU for cardiogenic shock with cold extremities, oligaria, severe pressure with 70 millimeters of mercury, and with severe anemia that was related to angiodysplasia that was identified on coloscopy. So, of course, he uh, was refused, he was given vasopressor, noradrenia, etc. And ultimately, the course of the patient was favorable. Now, once he was stabilized, he was referred again to another institution to have his cardiac surgery. The initial one, they did not want to accept him because they, they gave him an appointment earlier, uh, I mean, in, in 2020, but he didn't go. So we, we sent him to another institution, and the patient was due to have surgery on August 1st, 2022, but he was declined by an anesthesiologist when he was there. The anesthesiologist has asked for the coronoscopy biopsy report that the patient did not have. And thus, the patient returned home, he was disappointed, and he was waiting for the document to be ready. But in the meantime, the patient experienced another episode of decompensated heart failure. And unfortunately, he died in the emergency room of his, of his local primary health care center. Back to you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Gamra, for this um, interesting case, despite his dramatic end. Uh, but uh, it's a very real, real case uh, of our clinical uh, practice. Uh, so I will ask a question to Dr. Uh, Fadel from uh, Mauritania. Uh, how sh would you treat these patients, uh, especially uh, about the, the indication? Would you refer it to, uh, to the surgeon, to uh, surgery, aortic valve replacement, or you will indicate uh, TAVI? Uh, this is uh, my first question. And uh, the second question is also about uh, uh, pacemaker, the indication of um, implantation of this peacemaker for this uh, patient. Uh, so uh, up to you, uh, Dr. Fader. 
Thank you, uh, Professor Abid and uh, Professor Gamara. Sorry for you lost your patient after a lot of good uh, work. You tried and you tried and you tried, but apparently the higher power was going against you. So uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I think this patient uh, was diagnosed as early as uh, Professor Gamara can. Uh, Professor Gamara, sorry, uh, can do, and uh, he sent him for a place where everything was done. So yes, I think the patient. Uh, ejection fraction was symptomatic to begin with. Ejection fraction, I think I hear it, it was impaired. I'm not sure. And I wasn't able to see what was the dimension of the patient. In any way, the patient is symptomatic and aortic stenosis is severe, so the patient is heading towards surgery. The question is, is it surgery or is it uh, TAVI? Sorry, in Mauritania, we still we don't have TAVI. So unless the patient is able to go by his own financial, you know, he's able to go, or if he's assured and our team, I mean, we don't have a hard team, hopefully we'll be having that shortly, but we do have like some sort of meeting, both the cardiologist and the cardiovascular surgeon will meet and they will decide if this case can't be done in our center or we should send this patient for, you know, outside where, you know, the best we think will be able to be done for this patient. So. I think this patient, 75, COPD, smoker. If I was in a place TAVI can be done, probably I'll be heading for TAVI, for, toward TAVI. Definitely after assessing his, you know, your, after the score for the surgery. I think there will be a good, you know, heart team will decide it. But I think he will fit better. I don't know. Sorry, Professor Gamara, you are my professor. Your decision is always right. Now, this is regarding the TAVI. Regarding the pacemaker, I think if the ejection of fraction was altered, I don't know how far was low. Probably I will think about CRT. I don't know if the patient was on proper medical treatment, but I thought about CRT, CRT, D. I don't know, I didn't see the issue. Yes, uh, I don't know that you are as, I don't know the progression through the two years while, you know, we were hit by the COVID, the patient, we lost, you know, a contact with the patient for a good period of time. I honestly don't know how long was that, I don't, I mean, Something was triggered me. I thought when the aortic stenosis is the cause for degenerative conduction system and the patient documentally have a complete heart block, I think it will be there for the rest of his life because it's most likely because of the fibrosis of the conduction system. Doesn't matter on the level of the AV node or somewhere above it, downward of it. I thought it will be permanent unless you know, a patient has some sort of the infection and temporarily went through some sort of temporarily myopericard it and he recovered from it. We, we may have, but we may go back to the uh, sinus bradycardia. So yes, I think patient what he almost survived it. I think you did an excellent job. And I think if you, you know, if you, if you got another one who was able to, uh, uh, to take this patient for, the, for, a, for a surgery, the valve will be implanted and patient might be with us uh, today. So yes, uh, putting a, a double pacemaker was a good idea, patient syncope, symptomatic. The question is only if you might, if the FR was altered and you know, QRS was wide. I didn't know about the details of that. Yes, it's indicated in this patient uh, and regarding, uh, you know, an indication for the valve placement is there and we should be going for the heart team to decide which one is better. And my heart was going for what I don't think what Professor Gamma will say. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, you, Professor. I think it was a good job, man. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fadel. Uh, certainly, uh, COVID-19 yeah. pandemic uh, played uh, a major role in this uh, dramatic end of a patient. And of this very, very, very long journey, a patient's journey. Uh, and uh, so, Dr. Gamra, you like to add something? So. Yes, uh, I just wanted actually to mention the fact that uh, this is not this is not the usual course of a patient with aortic stenosis uh, in Tunisia, uh, and uh, there are many factors uh, that have played a role actually in very and this uh, very uh, uh, very very uh, adverse outcome. Unfortunately, uh, mainly the COVID. The COVID pandemic has played a role, and that has made actually the patient to wait for surgery two years approximately. And to answer one of your questions. The LV function has deteriorated during that period of time. That's why uh, he presented with, with cardiogenic shock two years later. So COVID has played a role. And, uh, uh, and the fact that the patient was living in a rural area, the fact that he did not have 
a uh, medical insurance that also played a role, and maybe we can have the discussion uh, later on. Now, I just would like to share with you uh, the question uh, in the chat box we have, because we have many now. Uh, one question from Ana Maria Codriano, uh, I think that was about coronary angiography prior to aortic valve replacement. Of course, I think I did mention it. Uh, it's, uh, it's there. Uh, also, another question about uh, whether the heart failure symptoms were due to the AV block or worsening LV function of the uh, severe aortic stenosis. The AV block was treated prior to the pandemic uh, and then uh, the uh, hospitalization for cardiogenic shock uh, was mainly due to severe aortic stenosis. Uh, and then... Uh, there was a question regarding, do we need to assess for hibernating myocardium? Uh, what's, this is a question from Kedir Negeso from Ethiopia. Any response from uh, can I, can, can I uh, one of the colleagues? Yes, can I say something, Dr. Fadel? Yeah, yeah, Dr. Fadel. You know, yeah, I thought, thought it's a good question regarding the hibernating myocardium. I think the core was normal, so it definitely has a good blood supply for the myocardium. So I don't know why he mentions hibernating myocardium. In cases of core normal, uh, you know, I think the blood supply is good, unless the person who asked thinks the degeneration of, you know, the the the, 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 cal you know, the calcic the calcium deposition in the myocardium, and I think probably the you know, the MRI would be better to assessing for that. So, no, I don't think, you know, well, I think it's a question, but I think it depends on blood supply. The hibernating myocardium, uh, when, you know, I don't know if you want us to do stress test, and is that for what? Uh, yeah. No, we may have to look for, I, mean, I don't know, we may look for the, you know, for the reserve by doing the Dubtrex injection, but still, uh, you know, we have a core normal. We have, a, you know, Professor Gamara did the core and it was normal. So the blood supply for the area is good. I, I, I agree with you. Opinion. Yeah. yeah, I agree with yeah. you. There is no indication to uh, effort test or to search for hibernation or sedation because the, the angiogram is normal. The art, coronary arteries are normal. There is a good perfusion of the myocardium. So I think so. Um, probably, Dr. Gamra, uh, while you are, you are waiting for the question from the box chat, I will ask question for our uh, uh, colleagues from Mauritania. To, uh, we need your, their opinions uh, and to discuss about, uh, but because as you know, there are uh, uh, three ways to treat severe aortic stenosis. Uh, aortic valve replacement, surgery aortic valve replacement, TAVI, or uh, balloon aortic valvuloplasty. Uh, so uh, my question is, uh, uh, in Mauritania, is the access to cardiac surgery easy? And what is the average uh, waiting time for surgery? You say, say uh, in this case, uh, the patient lost uh, many times to uh, uh, arrive to the surgeon. But what is the situation uh, in uh, Mauritania? Yes, uh, <clears throat> Leila, thank you very much. Uh, uh, effect uh, is the element that determines the surgical uh, treatment in Mauritania are three. Uh, emergency uh, degree uh, and uh, waiting list. Sometimes a lot of patients waiting and we have to choose the uh, first uh, emergency before. And uh, three uh, point is uh, the financial support. So some patients uh, uh, we don't have uh, insurance, uh, sometimes waiting for a social, uh, uh, social uh, assistant to, to make it. And uh, this uh, emergency support, emergency case, uh, is uh, only the dissection, aortic the dissection, and valve prothesis thrombosis or uh, myxoma. So the three cases, uh, they don't wait uh, more than 24 hours. Uh, aortic stenosis sometimes 
we do balloon dilatation uh, for just uh, like a bridge before surgery. Uh, but for TAVI, uh, we will maybe uh, in this uh, uh, end of this year, we have one of our international cardiologists uh, is in France to training. And maybe in the last of this year, we uh, do it in Mauritania. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, Dr. Gami, would like to add uh, something Leila. about uh, the situation in Tunisia? Yes. Y yes. Uh, b before going to the situation in Tunisia, I would like to share with you a few questions from the chat box. Okay. And okay. one question from Dr. Elijah Rutahaba, uh, who says, in terms of prognosis, would Heidi syndrome pose a worse prognosis? It appears it was the case in this patient. Heidi syndrome, see, uh, it's the relationship between aortic stenosis and angiodysplasia, mm -hmm. as this patient uh, uh, presented with. Dr. Uh, Ahmed or Dr. Mohammed, would like to yes, answer? Uh, yes, for uh, other. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, yes, yeah, I think it's a very well uh, known combination. You know, a patient, uh, sometimes even it's not an angiodysplasia, uh, sometimes some sort of, uh, you know, rectal cancer will be associated with aortic stenosis. I think it will impact a bad prognosis. I honestly, we didn't see the biopsy of, if they did the biopsy for the angiodysplasia. So, yeah, I think it's a prognosis will be much worse in case of this too. Uh, but honestly, I don't know the mechanism of developing of aortic stenosis in case of the angiodysplasia, but it's a very well-known combination, and the prognosis is much better. And I think the patient probably bled from his angiodysplasia because hemoglobin was six, and, you know, and we know his ejection fraction was altered, so we do have both. Uh, epivolemic shock on top of a very weak heart or on top of the cardiogenic, sh uh, cardiogenic shock, and we lost that patient. So yes, I think you know, presence of other symptoms which we might face in case of we are dealing with, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, this scenario will make the burden much, much higher on the heart in case of the aortic stenosis, you know, in a very, like we'll say, uh, you know, the problem, if, if this is much harder than dealing with, uh, you know, aortic stenosis alone. That's what I think. Okay, thank you. Uh, great. Dr. Gamra, do you have another uh, other additional yes, questions? Yes, another question. You have? Yes. Uh, yes. I mean, there's, there's, there's no, there is no doubt that actually the relationship exists between the two. Uh, now, what is uh, also known that once you treat aortic stenosis, that angiodysplasia will disappear. Uh, and even it was even uh, shown after a old balloon aortic valvuloplasty in the early years. Another question from Dr. Kadir Negesso from Ethiopia. For the treating team, how was the anemia addressed as it further makes the prognosis worse? I think there was transfusion. And when the patient left the, our institution to go to cardiac surgery, he has a satisfactory uh, hemoglobin of, I think, around 11. Uh, another question by Dr. Ahmed Zahran, uh, mentioning anemia and heart disease, how to manage ACS patients with bleeding? Obviously, no way to give heparin or antiplatelets. I think this question uh, goes uh, beyond the topic of this, uh, uh, of this webinar. Uh, uh, of course, it's, it's a, challenging, a challenging situation, but uh, uh, it's not the topic uh, of today. Now, regarding uh, the, the, your question, uh, Leila, and what's happening in Tunisia now, uh, we have started uh, uh, the TAVI program a few years ago, uh, and uh, very recently, the Minister of Health has accepted to cover that procedure in three centers in Tunisia only. Now, even with the three centers, they have limited the number. So uh, the experience is going very, very slow, and the limitation to that is mainly uh, finances. It's quite expensive procedure, and cardiac surgery uh, it's, it's certainly uh, cheaper than TAVI. But TAVI has been proposed mainly to patients who are inoperable. In our experience, because we don't have it here available in my center, we have been doing balloon aortic valvuloplasty in the very critical patients. 
particularly those who cannot have surgery in their status. And that in that particular case, aortic valvuloplasty was performed as a bridge to cardiac surgery and surgical aortic valve replacement. Yes, Dr. Gamla, I agree with you about the situation in Tunisia, but recently we received a paper from the Minister of Health of Tunisia. I think that you received also this paper. You are head of the Department of Cardiology in Tunisia. And I think that they will cover some cases of TAVI for patients who don't have insurance. And I think that it will be a beginning to uh, cover these patients. Okay. Uh, so um, I think uh, we should now, uh, uh, let's uh, uh, see the opinions of other uh, experts, other operators from other countries. Uh, so Dr. Gamra, you will go invited for us uh, uh, an eminent expert in TAVI. Yes, uh, uh, Leila, we, we had the pleasure of inviting uh, Dr. Azim Latib, who is the Director of International Cardiology and the uh, 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 Structural Heart Disease in Montefiore Hospital in New York in the United States. But Azim is originally from South Africa and he knows very well the uh, uh, African reality. And we did, uh, uh, the, the, so the first question to ask to uh, uh, Azim is, uh, what is the common patient journey? in Europe and the United States in case of valvular heart disease. Azim? So if you look at the patient journey in Europe and the United States for patients with valvular heart disease, I think they're very different. I have a unique perspective because I've worked in both those countries treating patients, <clears throat> in both those continents treating patients with valvular disease. So let's start with Europe. Uh, in Europe, a patient will be referred to a local center um, especially if they're as ill as our current patient, well, they'll be initially evaluated. If that center does not have access to both transcatheter therapies and surgery, they'll be sent to a center that does, where the patient will undergo a multidisciplinary evaluation. In Europe, based on current guidelines, as someone who is low risk and 72 would probably be directed to uh, open heart surgery, uh, as the primary therapy. In the United States, I think the initial journey will be, will be similar. We also have to deal with a lot of patients who live in rural areas far away from big institutions. Uh, and usually when I get called by a patient like this, my first thing is to transfer the patient to my center, which is a tertiary center, and then institute a rapid evaluation. In my center, that evaluation would probably include um, getting the patient to have a repeat echo, understanding the severity of the valvular disease and how many valves are involved. Uh, since this is a patient with aortic stenosis, we go ahead and do a left and right heart catheterization if needed, uh, understand the coronary anatomy, understand the filling pressures. And then we'd also get a CAT scan to evaluate if this patient is a candidate for TAVA. Certainly in my center, a 72-year-old patient uh, who's low risk with good anatomy for transfemoral TAVA um, would, be, would, would be evaluated and get a TAVI within usually a matter of a few days. Um, and I think that would be the, that patient's journey. But in the fundamental part of it, irrespective of where this patient uh, is seen, whether that's Europe or the US, is the importance of having a multidisciplinary heart team evaluation, which includes interventional cardiology, cardiac surgery, at the very least, maybe heart failure, geriatrics, depending on the patient's age, but really <clears throat> presenting the patients with the best options that are available for them based on their age and comorbidities and involving the patient and their family in that process of shared decision-making. Okay, thank you, Azim. So how would you manage this particular patient that we have presented now? The patient we are discussing today is a 72-year-old low-risk patient with angiodysplasia, severe anemia, probably related to the underlying severe aortic stenosis, so what we would call Haid syndrome. In my center, um, the patient presented also in cardiogenic shock, um, probably related to the severe aortic stenosis and the anemia. So the process in my center would be, the first thing would be try and stabilize the patient, transfuse them, get them feeling better, 
If the patient doesn't improve rapidly, I may consider an urgent balloon valvuloplasty just to stabilize the patient. However, I think in most cases, just with blood transfusion fluids, you can stabilize this patient and get them more stable so you can make a proper decision. The decision-making uh, I would take into account is I would get a left heart catheterization looking at their coronaries and get a CAT scan to evaluate their aortic anat anatomy and their vascular access. If the patient was a good candidate for TAVA, in my center, he would get a TAVA with either a balloon or self-expandable valve as the first choice because the guidelines in the United States allow us to treat patients who are 65 years of, or older, irrespective of risk, if they are good anatomical candidates for TAVA. Thank you, uh, Azim, for this. Now, uh, how this patient would be followed up after therapy, in your opinion? In structural heart, one of the things that's really changed compared to how you know, uh, we treat patients with coronary interventions is really the importance of follow-up by the treating team. So in my center, a patient who undergoes a TAVA procedure would usually get discharged the day after the procedure. They would then within a week be seen again, either by myself or by the referring cardiologist, just to make sure the access sites were okay, there are no bleeding issues and the patient's feeling fine. I then, at 30 days, see all my patients again. I do a trans echo on them to evaluate valve function, gradients, paravalvular leak, look at the other valves, the LV function. I do an EKG just to make sure that there are no new conduction disturbances or that any conduction disturbances I saw before have uh, resolved. And then I usually see my patients annually to continue to man monitor their valve function. I think one of the things we still trying to figure out with transcatheter heart valves is the durability and longevity of these valves. So I think it's important for centers to be still involved in how we manage these patients afterwards and continue to follow them up annually to make sure that our valves are functioning well, there's no issues as regards to either valve thrombosis, infection, or degeneration. And I think it also allows us to then act on any issues that earlier than when they could be causing potentially disturbing symptoms for our patients. Thank you, Azim, very much for these uh, answers and for your contribution. Uh, now, back to you, Leigh. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Gamla. Thank you to Dr. Azim for this interesting uh, Doc, talk. Uh, do you have other questions uh, in the box chat chat box? There was a question regarding the pacemaker, whether or not you should, uh, uh, after uh, our surgical valve replacement, whether or not you should remove that pacemaker and allow me to answer that. Of course, you cannot do that. Uh, the pacemaker is there and the patient might need it actually, and uh, you would not uh, reverse his conduction abnormalities after aortic stenosis, particularly in this particular case, a case where surgical aortic valve replacement was performed two years approximately after the uh, the uh, pacemaker. Because we have only five minutes to close uh, this webinar, probably I'd like to ask uh, you, each expert, uh, about the the key uh, home messages messages. Uh, that uh, you like to share with us, with the audience. I, uh, I begin probably with Dr. Uh, Fadel. Um, thank you so much. You know, I think the case was presented by Professor Gamala is just the typical case for a poor person who lives in Mauritania. They will just go, they will deal with the same symptoms. The first, because of the lack of education. They will have chest pain, shortness of breath, but they will not think in a very serious cause, you know, led them to this. So it's like typical. We see this and we see, we see it with mitral regurgitation. We see it with mitral stenosis. And most of our cases come so late to us. So, and I think, I hope, you know, a lot of people uh, take these symptoms very uh, seriously. And I, and I do hope that's more you know, just have some sort of uh, insurance so they will be able, if they diagnose, you know, they are dealing with this uh, kind of diagnosis, you know, the treatment will be available for them. Yeah, I think the poverty is one of the keys why 
we, we still we lose a lot of patients, you know, and we, we are we are able to diagnose them and at least you know surgery or TAVI, uh, and hopefully as our director said, TAVI is you know on the way coming to Mauritania. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Great, uh, Dr. Ahmed, floor is yours. Yes, just I I will uh, invite uh, the. Uh, uh, my colleague in Africa to uh, make a, a lot of job in uh, uh, in primary uh, uh, um, uh, in primary la je voudrais dire en français la prévention primaire primary prevention uh, primary prevention yes primary prevention because uh, the difference still very huge between uh, north of Africa and sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, a, a, a few a few country has a good program against rheumatic heart disease. Uh, Tunisia have a good program, and we, uh, we uh, Tunisia have now less than Mauritania, less than Senegal, less than sub-African Saharan uh, countries, uh, rheumatic heart uh, disease. So, and I will invite the government of uh, these people to invest in uh, uh, secondary and, uh, uh, and tertiary uh, prevention. So I will invite uh, also, the industrialist, industrial, industrial uh, in developed country, to make a, a price of consumable of medical device uh, very cheap uh, to in uh, sorted in Africa for uh, in the uh, in the fine uh, we can go uh, do uh, uh, cardiac surgery and TAVI or. Uh, uh, cardiology, interventional cardiology, uh, cheaper than uh, now, actually. Great, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Dr. Sidi okay. uh, Mohamed. Yeah. Okay. Maybe, maybe dear, in the, uh, our country is, uh, in this case, is uh, balloon uh, valvuloplasty dilatation is an alternative for TAVI. Uh, and coverage uh, or uh, f uh, replacement valvular aortic. In uh, our uh, department, cardiology interventional is uh, facility and uh, my uh, balloon aortic uh, dilatation uh, and patient uh, instable hemodynamic. Okay, th thank you, Dr. Sidi Mohammed. Uh, Dr. Gamra? Your uh, key message? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Leila, once again. Yes. Thank you again, and thanks to PCR for this uh, opportunity. I, I think, once again, I, this is not the usual journey of a patient with aortic stenosis in Tunisia. I uh, uh, wanted to show it to you because it would illustrate the journey in many African countries. Now, the situation in Tunisia is, is quite good because we have 80% of the patients who have medical insurance and the other 20%, uh, they don't have insurance, but they do have government insurance. So uh, it's not a matter of insurance, but COVID-19 has played a major role uh, in, for, for this particular case. And it, it is certainly responsible for, uh, in part at least, <clears throat> in the very bad outcome of this patient. Now, in practice, and in any case, the journey of a patient like this should be defined in, in a written document. Uh, so that, that uh, as, as we, we've done it in Tunisia for rheumatic fever, that is almost eliminated now, thanks to a national program with written documents, so that the primary healthcare physician knows how to deal with kinds of, of this patient, what to keep in his, in his hospital, what to refer, and who to refer, and to whom so that the management of these patients can be really optimal. Now, TAVI, and this is an emerging uh, you know, technology in Africa, uh, the indication for, for TAVI should not be the same than indication of TAVI in Europe and the United States, simply because it's really expensive 
And you spend if you spend too much money in Tabi, you will certainly take it from money that will be useful in a younger population. So this is has to be really thought. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Gamra. We are short in time. I agree with all of you. Uh, probably I propose to elaborate a common a guide of patient journey in Africa, but adapted to the context of uh, each uh, country. And we need many efforts to improve the management uh, of uh, our patient, despite the differences and uh, between uh, the different countries. Uh, so uh, really, it was a very, very uh, instructive uh, uh, hour uh, webinar. And I like to thank uh, all the experts, uh, the, thing, the, the audience, uh, to, to thank also uh, uh, Africa PCR uh, Board for their kind invitation and their very, very uh, nice uh, initiative. And I uh, hope to see you uh, soon. And uh, I'd like to invite you to the next uh, webinar. It will be uh, held in two days, uh, the 20th of October. And uh, it will, will be entitled, How Should I Treat a Patient with Pacing? With Egypt, it will be a collaboration between uh, Egypt and uh, Kenya. So uh, thank you a lot uh, for you, for the audience, for the speakers, for the discussion. Thank you for Africa PCR Board. Uh, see you uh, soon. Uh, keep safe uh, and uh, have a nice uh, afternoon. Bye. All right. Thank you.